Hey, what's going on? Welcome to the Mile High Five podcast. It's Doug here, and I wanted to pop in to introduce this episode. This is an interview with Chris and Deb from Go Bucket Yourself. And if you're a longtime listener, you might remember this episode from 2022, early 2022. And that was episode 52. The thing is, it's summertime and Carl's on a road trip. He was doing the special research over at Yale and Harvard. You could refer to previous episodes, but there were a couple kind of big deal studies about vegetables and urine. And Carl is an enthusiast, I think, as many of you know. So he was out there. Plus, you know, there's, you know, just the busyness of the summer. So we have leaned into republishing some old yet evergreen episodes. In fact, Carl and I thought we were going to be able to record a little bit more when we were at Camp Phi just last weekend, but we were recorded one live episode and we didn't get a chance to record more. There's so many people there, but you just end up talking and hanging out. And honestly, that's more fun than recording a, a full episode. And I have to set up cables and wires and some other thing like that. Anyway, Chris and Deb are fantastic. In this episode, we talk about, uh, my notes here say, pooping in the woods. So I, I'm pretty sure that question came from Carl. That's, uh, that's his area. This is area of expertise, among other things. And we talk about go bucket yourself, why they started it. We also talk about limiting beliefs versus adventure and how challenges make us better as well as out of state, i.e. long distance real estate investing. So if you have a chance to connect with Chris and Deb, highly recommend it. They are uh, frequent attendees at, at different conferences and camps that I've been able to hang out with them in person in several different states over a few years. They're awesome people. You should check out Go Bucket Yourself, the blog and the podcast. I'll put links in the description here so you can check it out. And I think that's it for the intro, but as normal, we ate do have a sponsor, and that is GhostBed. GhostBed's awesome. They've been a sponsor for a little while now, and they have mattresses, they have bed frames, they have bundles, so if you're ready to upgrade your full sleeping system, you can do that, and I would highly recommend checking out either the adjustable base or the split king adjustable set, and the, the thing is, being able to elevate, I, I'm a reader, I read in bed, uh, usually fiction before I go to bed, and I read pretty much every single night, so with the ability to uh, you know, raise and have that adjustable frame, it's awesome. Usually I've in the past, I've like stacked up pillows. And with the split king, your bed mate, your partner can have a, a sort of a different elevation. And you could also like lift the legs up, the knees bend, and it's very cool. You should check it out. They have a wide range of mattresses. And if you're unsure, because some people like a firm mattress, some people like a softer one, sometimes we don't know what we actually want. You could hop over to ghostbed.com and you'll see a quiz that you could take and it'll help you walk through what kind of mattress you should check out. They have a wide variety of mattresses, so surely there's one that you'll like and you'll find it super comfortable. But they also have a 101 night at home sleep trial, so you're able to actually test it out at home to figure out if you really do like it. One other little plug, I'm a hot sleeper, I always mention that. If you are a hot sleeper and you wanna try something a little bit different, I really like the gel memory foam so that the foam mattress or sorry, the foam pillow is very comfortable. I actually like those better. I bring it when I travel. If it's not too, uh, you know, large, I'm not going to bring it on a plane, but we do a lot of road trips. Anyway, there's a gel uh, on top and it, it's very cool. And for my bald head, it just sucks the heat right out of there. I mean, it feels really good. And in fact, if, if you are hot, another tip, if you're open to this, you could shave your head and you lose a lot of heat out of your head. It's not only a, a great look, but it's comfortable too. And I don't buy shampoo or conditioner, but I think I'm going down a different route now. Anyway, thanks a lot to GhostBed. You can save 50% if you go to ghostbed.com slash fi You'll save 50% site-wide and you can 
type in a coupon code to if you navigate in differently, Mile High Fi at checkout. So thanks to Ghostbed, and let's get to the episode now. This is the Mile High Fi podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Huntington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Fi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Fi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Fi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, world. Welcome to the Mile High Fi podcast. My name is Carl Johnson, and I'm here with... I'm Doug Cunnington. And we have two awesome guests today. Tell us who you are and what you do. I'm Debbie Emick with Chris Emick. We, what do we do, Chris? What do you do, Debbie? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things, for sure. Mom wife, real estate. We have a little side gig called Go Bucket Yourself. So, Yeah. So I'm Chris Emick and I go out into the woods and poop in holes and <laughs> I'm a father and a podcaster. But yeah, we're early retirees um, that left the traditional job and are in like year two of that and uh, exploring what do we do with our, with our time and our lives. Okay, so I have an opening here, but the poop and holes cracks me up. I think that would be a good name for a fly for a fly blog. I yeah. poop in holes. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. That, now is that a job or you just do it for fun? I do both. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, some days it's a job. Some days it's like ah, it's too dang cold to to drop my tra- tra- drawers yeah. uh, in the middle of the woods and poop. But some days it's so pleasurable, like the best views ever when taking a. Oh my a dump. gosh! Yeah. Give a little bit of context. That, I am giving a lot of context. Actually, <laughs> maybe yeah. too much. Yeah, maybe we could back into that part, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. But why? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's probably pretty healthy. You're squatting, which is supposed to be good. They sell those squatty potties. Ooh, that might be a good sponsor for us, Doug. So you're, yeah. you're squatting, you're out in the woods enjoying nature. I would just be afraid of the extreme cold and what it might do to your icicle, Chris. Yes, it, it is. It has happened before and you should be afraid, but it's, it's worth it. Risk reward. Okay. So back to normal topics. We got sidetracked there real quick. We usually, that usually happens about 20 or 30 minutes and not one minute. And on your blog, Go Bucket Yourself, you mentioned some some really cool adventures. And I'm looking at the list here, like learning to surf in Ecuador, climbing Pico de, I don't even know how to say it, Arizaba in Mexico. Pico de Arizaba, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've backpacked the Grand Canyon. You've explored the Inside Passage of Alaska by cruise ship. That sounds like fun. Uh, hitting the slopes. What are some of your favorite recent adv- adventures? What have you done lately and which ones are your favorites? Speaking of pooping in the woods, maybe you want to go first. Yeah. Are we, we going to just stick with this? <laughs> You're going to have an easy title for this episode, gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. So some of our more recent ones, uh, last year, I spent 53 days on the Arizona trail, hiked 800 miles from the Mexico border to Utah. That was a, a solo trip. And it was it was my intention after I retired to do that kind of uh, walkabout, but I retired, you know, right before 2020, and a lot of travel plans, a lot of just questions of will there be toilet paper um, were circling. So I didn't actually have that adventure in 2020. So last year in in uh, March and April of 2021, Deb and my, our two daughters Claire and Lila said, "You can go, Father." And I went and uh, and I went and walked and met some amazing people along that journey. And that was that was extra special. Sorry, I was going to go, but I don't know if you have a follow up question for him or not. I I do have one short one, and uh, this keeps on coming up. I can't stop myself. You mentioned toilet paper shortages. Is that what you (laughs) use when you poop in a hole? Do you have some kind of special biodegradable, like septic septic tank version, or how does that (laughs) work in mechanics? So the principles of leave no trace allow you to put your feces into the hole but you need to hike out your paper. And so that is, uh, but yeah, so I use normal uh, two-ply toilet paper and and you just hike it out with you, which means you don't have a trash can every day. So you have that in your pack for a few days in its own little special bag that uh, you you are very sure, <laughs> you know, does not uh, make sure you, you you close that one really tight and everything. But uh, yeah, that's that's the that's the way you do it. Yeah, don't get that anywhere near your food bag or mix them up in the middle of the night. You're reaching in, you get a midnight snack. Ah! You do not want that to happen, correct. Okay, so Chris, how about you? What's an awesome recent adventure? Yeah, so 
Yeah. I'm sorry. I skipped Debbie. Sorry. That is okay. I will try to make this the only time I say the word feces the rest of this uh, interview. Mine will not involve that. But Chris did get me a trip to a surf camp in Costa Rica. Uh, that was like a week long adventure for sure. Getting a little more familiar with surfing and being able to do that. And then my dad and my daughter met me down in Costa Rica and we extended that adventure um, later in the year I went to Costa Rica on my own, looking for some rental real estate. So there was a lot of Costa Rica and surfing adventure for me last year. And I'd say that was probably the highlight for sure. I've been surfing too, only once. Did you enjoy it? Yes, for sure. I mean, it was hard. There were moments I didn't enjoy it that I remember specifically a moment like just lost in the wave going like, well, if this is how I'm supposed to go, I know I'm in the right place, you know? So there were many ups and downs, but it was great. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that, Deb, because I had that exact same experience of surfing and in San Diego and when the wave comes, you're supposed to flip over. I, I think it's the turtle maneuver or something. There's some name for it. And I do that and I'm underwater. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pop up. Okay, I'm going to pop up. And then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to die. And <laughs> and this is yeah. how, how I'm going to go. <laughs> I guess it would have been a good way to die. Um, <laughs> although drowning is unpleasant. <laughs> yeah. I bet so. Yeah. yeah. We're hitting a lot of pretty hot topics here in the beginning, but we'll, we'll shift it back. <laughs> so on your blog and podcast, you talk a lot about travel. And a lot of people are probably thinking, I mean, they figured out that you guys are not working full-time jobs right now, but you did travel a lot with your kids while you were still working a little bit, right? So can you tell us mm -hmm. how you were able to, to do that and pull it off and make sure that they were getting an education and that socially everything was going okay? Very, very broad question, but like, how do you do that kind of thing with kids? Yeah. So one of the the bigger trips was I think 2018. So about a year before I was going to leave, but I knew I was going to leave. Um, it was kind of like a, a beta test trip. Uh, like, let's see if this is something the Emic family wants to do. And so I, I arranged it with my my work where I took a week of vacation. We went to Ecuador. I took a week of vacation, worked remotely for a week in the middle, and then took another week of vacation on the backside. So three weeks to kind of... Uh, do some exploration. I love climbing mountains and Ecuador uh, has a plenty of mountains. And then we went down to the city for the week that I worked so that I could have a good internet connection. And the girls, the intention was actually to do some uh, volunteering that week, but something changed with that. So it was just, you know, the girls getting exposure to, to the culture. Our oldest wasn't in Spanish class. She wasn't in high school then. So she wasn't taking formal Spanish through the school, but we were, we were practicing Spanish around the house. And like we would test, not test them, but we would have them like if they wanted to order something or if they had a question to try at least, you know, to, to get through that hurdle. Cause that's a, for a lot of people that, that are trying to learn a new language, you know, just even trying feels so awkward. Like it's like, Oh, I'm so embarrassed or, and we wanted to kind of dispel and remove that piece of it. And so as far as the education, we're, we're well into our homeschool journey, but at that time we, it was a little bit newer. So we did have a lot of the fears that probably a lot of folks that have never homeschooled do have, which is, oh my gosh, are my kids going to fall behind? Or this isn't, you know, what the, the, the quote unquote normal system teaches them or allows for them to do. And so it might feel like that's not good to, uh, to kind of buck the trend, but, uh, I'm sure all four of us have bucked the trend in many ways before. And so education is just another one that the more we buck the trend, uh, the more we found like, oh, <laughs> there's only there's a lot of good happening over here on this this alternative side of education that that isn't always told about. Yeah. So when we went to Ecuador, we just took school with us because both of our daughters were homeschooled. We also went to uh, Puerto Vallarta for a few weeks right before the pandemic happened. And at that time, our oldest daughter was back in public school in high school. And so she worked it out with her teachers to be able to do school remotely while we were there. It was probably, you know, full disclosure, not ideal for her. She didn't love that. And she learned a lot from that about communicating with her teachers. So it was a, it was a good lesson for her, but not super comfortable at the time. Um, and our youngest daughter is still homeschooled. So that 
allows a lot of freedom. We're just more tied to our oldest daughter's schedule now in high school and with her high school sports activities and stuff. But it's definitely possible with her in school, we wouldn't do like months worth of travel at this point unless we had some alternative for her. But yeah, we've we've tried it both ways. Um, and her teachers were pretty flexible when we traveled and she was in public school still. So Got it. And with the pandemic and people being forced to homeschool and do the non-traditional stuff, how do you think it has impacted the ability or belief for people to do that sort of thing? Or if you've heard any firsthand stories, that could be interesting too. I know some people are getting out and traveling a bit more like every day, really. Yeah. Because their kids are schooled from home, you're saying now? Uh, yes, that yeah. I have no kids, so I'm asking a perhaps mm-hmm. ignorant question. But uh, yeah, yeah, do you think there's anything to that? Yeah, I think um, Carl probably knows a lot about this, like a big adjustment for people that aren't used to that. Over time, like I, I was a public school teacher for like 14 years. That was my my job originally. And so I, when I first started homeschooling, I just really held on tight to all of all of the public school way of being like really pushed hard, probably really overdid it, really worried about my children socially and academically. And what I've learned over time is to just like hold it a lot looser, like things really work out. I pu- Homeschool is not public school. They will learn, you know, it's not like we're just out playing all the time, but playing is a lot of learning, traveling to Ecuador and just having adventures that there's a lot of learning that goes into that and socially. So I imagine that adjustment being very difficult for parents. I'm sure, Carl, you can speak to that a lot more than I can. And the flip flop of going, at least in our community, like the, you know, it's all at home right now. Oh, now we're back in person. Now we're back at home and trying to work that out with a job. Yeah. I think that we had a much easier transition because we were used to it and we already had the freedom of not having regular nine to five gigs. So I, I have a lot of compassion for parents who were working and trying to figure that all out at once. Yeah. That's what I I feel like the firsthand stories I know (laughs) that were a negative was this was just forced, you know, into like, we approach this with curiosity and openness of like, okay, we're going to try this experiment, we're going to do this homeschooling. And we we kind of curated our lives to allow for that. Whereas a lot of folks were were forced and whether that they had to completely re- readjust their schedules and completely readjust, you know, their activities and everything that would that would be a harder pill to swallow than us who kind of were the ones that welcomed this in. But I do know some people that did, it did kind of take some things away like, oh, like it, you know, it doesn't have to be like eight hours sitting at a desk to be quote unquote learning. Like you can, (laughs) you, you, you don't need as much time, like kind of like what we all probably realized with our our previous jobs, working eight hours a day is like, it ain't eight eight hours. (laughs) You know, a lot of times is not necessary to have a quote unquote productive day. Like you can, you can get a lot of shit done in one solid hour of flow, you know? So. I can only do about two and a half hours of work per day, I realized. So, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. actual focus. Yeah, Chris, uh, I was talking to Physician on Fire, and I used to be a a little bit more skeptical about homeschool. And then I was talking to him, and he's like, you think your kid goes to school for seven hours a day. How How much of that time is actually super valuable to their learning? They've got recess. They've got lunchtime. They've got the teacher yelling at kids who weren't behaving. They're going through a lot of the stuff that your particular child might already know. So if you can do it well and tailor it to your kids, I think you can probably spend less than half of the time they do in a school day and get just as much more out of it, if not more. Yeah, my experience was a mixed bag. My my older kid was a yeah. self-starter and she's more of a loner like me and our younger one was very social and we fought a lot, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. yeah, that happens here too. For yes. sure. <laughs> so let's let's talk about Go Bucket Yourself. It's a great name, and it's it's a blog and podcast, right? They kind of they're intertwined, right? So why did you start it? There's so many blogs out there. What makes y'all's story unique? 
Yeah. So I knew I wanted to do something after I left work. And because we we built um, a portfolio of rental real estate, and I, I think this is probably something we'll touch on a little bit later, but rental real estate was the means to the end to get us to where we had enough passive income to leave our traditional jobs and explore what the, these next chapters of our lives look like. But it wasn't this something that I wanted to keep doing. Like I didn't have the passion to be like, oh, I, now that we have 19 houses, I want to get to 38 and then I want to get to 100. So I knew real estate wasn't going to be my jam that I wanted to keep finding deals or teaching people how to find deals or even go down that route. But I did want to, to live a, a bigger life than myself. I, I'm not just chasing a goal that makes Chris Simic happy. I want to pay it back, pay it forward, pay it all over the place for the, the mentors that either had the podcasts or the books or the, the meetups that, that really empowered me to get off my ass and, and start changing my life. And so I wanted to do that in the flair that I know how, which is to, to... I love connecting people. I love getting out in nature. And so my original idea with Go Bucky Yourself is I want to take people out into nature and somehow curate, facilitate, or just be witness to some, some good life-changing experiences that we don't always get you know, from a podcast or from a book or, or, or whatever. And so I was like, well, if I want to have events, someone's at least got to know that this thing exists. So I better create a podcast. Our blog isn't very active. So there are some articles up there, but they're, <laughs> they're all probably very old and whatnot. But uh, that, was, that's what, that was the impetus, I guess. And then Deb, you want to? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely middle aged, right? And as we reached our late 30s and going into 40s, we realized that we weren't alone in this feeling of like, I've built this whole life and it may not be what I really want, like the white picket fence, the nine to five, the good pension. Uh, we wanted to be able to like live our adventures today, not, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years down the road. So, Everything we do with Go Bucket Yourself is des it's designed to empower other people in those stages of life that are like, oh, this isn't really the life I want. This is maybe the life society told me I wanted, or this car and this big house didn't really fulfill me or make me happy. What will fulfill me? What will make me happy? And so, yeah, the podcast helps build that community and eventually hopefully leads to this adventure retreat where we help people design their life, begin taking steps toward that empowered vision today and not someday. And then you cite core values, which you, you embedded in a couple of those answers, but I'm going to list out the couple here. Overcome fear, grow your mindset, eliminate obstacles and live adventurously. So can you unpack each one of those, maybe give an example or why you, you mentioned it in the, you know, just four that you had and you guys could tag team and go back and forth. Sure. So overcome fear in particular is just a big piece of deciding for us, first of all, to use money we had saved and put aside to invest. There was a lot of fear around that in the beginning that in retrospect, we might think is kind of silly at this point. And then beginning to build the life or do the things that we had been putting off also required overcoming whatever sense of fear. So however we were raised, whatever we were taught about the right life we should be living, going against that and doing something different and putting ourselves out there, right? So I wrote and published a book and that was, there was so much, the whole thing was a lot of fear, right? So all of these little steps that we've taken to build this life that, that we feel is fulfilling and purposeful requires overcoming fear along the way. Yeah. And then the, on the eliminating obstacles piece, um, I just have found a lot of value in uh, Ryan Holiday's book, The Obstacle is the Way. He's, he's a very stoic, like capital S stoic philosopher guy. And he takes the, you know, these, this ancient stoic philosophy and, and relates it to modern days. And one thing that he does well in The Obstacle is the Way is highlight stories of how people actually were better off through their adversity. Like if they didn't actually have any adversities or they didn't hit enough obstacles, you know, it, it was actually they were better by going through that. And so then when we look at back at our life, we can see that. So Debbie at 30 
up until that point, we're living a completely normal uh, health-wise life. Like We're not really paying attention a whole lot. We're not going to doctors. Everything's great uh, as far as we know. And then her body just starts to deteriorate um, at a pretty rapid pace. And we did not understand that. We did not understand the medical system and and everything that went with that. So at first, it was like, this is a, a huge downer. Like this is going to be something she has to live with with the rest of her life. It may impact how long she can live. Um, our, our families and our dreams are going to look a lot different in a negative way than, than we originally uh, thought they might. But actually, it helped us to wake up out of that fog or get off of the path of someone else. You know, the, the white picket fence, the nine to five, be safe with your money, hoard your money. Those were, were obstacles or those were fears that we had, but we used the obstacle of Debbie's wake up call that look life isn't guaranteed you don't you don't know if you have tomorrow you don't know if you have 60 you don't know if you have 75 so you know use that and that has like that has been the starting point to the reason we're talking to you guys today that we went to a fincon that we read these books that we bought inv- our first investment property that we had our first little workshop you know all of those things can easily be traced back to if Debbie's health wouldn't have taken that turn we would have probably still been, you know, talking about like, oh, Carl, guess what car I got this week? Or, you know, I'm, I'm doing this, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, and speaking of empowering others, when we're talking about eliminating obstacles, I'm, you guys might hear this a lot as well, when people might say something like, well, that works for you because you have this passive income or you could make it work or that works for you because, but each of these steps from getting to where from where we were to where we are here required all four of these things that you listed out that are on our website right like we had those thoughts like well this would never work for us because so we had to overcome the fear and then get over the whatever the obstacle was in the path at that point and then sort of grow our mindset so that those fears and obstacles didn't keep standing in our way and so yeah and living adventurously is just one of our values as, as a human, it, I think adds to our personal growth and our enjoyment of our lives. So, yeah. And I think adventurous for a lot of people like uh, Carl, we talked about this when you were on our podcast, like some people think of a bucket list or adventure as like, Oh, that's going bungee jumping off of a big bridge. I, I, I think adventure is, is writing a book or starting a podcast or, you know, homeschooling your kids, you know, it doesn't always have to be like, you only live once type of like wild shit that's going to go nuts on Instagram. It can be just things that it's like, here's my comfort zone. I'm stepping outside. I'm going to go dig a hole. I'm going to shit in the woods. <laughs> Boom. Oh, I need to shit. Hopefully you can curse on your podcast or you're going to have a lot I've of editing. i heard some naughty to words do. in others they've done. You've been so. cursing a lot. <laughs> no, we can, we totally and encourage, we encourage naughty words. So I think okay. I'll, I'd like to unpack a little bit of, of what you said. How do you, well, I'll back up a second. I think most people suffer from a negativity bias. So if you tell people about something awesome, they'll come up with a bunch of excuses for why it won't work. And I, I've always thought that thinking is kind of silly and I'm generalizing here, but there's downsides and there's upsides. So with fire, the downside is you might run out of money. And the worst case scenario is you'll have to do exactly what everyone else does, go back to your job. But the upside is infinite. There's so many good things that can happen. For me, from my perspective, it just makes complete sense to take that chance because you could totally change your life and that bad thing probably won't happen. So what do you tell people? How do you encourage people to live a more adventureful life? Well, I mean, we've learned a lot ourselves and had to change our mindset in little bits along the way, rather than looking at things from that negative bias perspective, like you're saying. And so we have a lot of firsthand experience with that. But I guess where we're at at this point in our life is to try to look at things from a more abundant centered place than this limited, you know, limiting belief or limited mindset type of thing. So rather than saying, what if we lose all of our money? uh, We look at it from, like you said, Carl, well, if we lose all of our money, we have a lot of skills. We have, uh, you know, time and energy. We could easily make more money. So I think that's one mindset shift, but we've played out all of those scenarios, like as I'm sure you have. And 
saw that if those did happen, there were ways out of them on the other side. What do you say to that, Chris? Yeah, I, I think there is, you know, there's the, that, that's really what we like to do with, with our podcast is have people tell their stories. So like Jillian Johns Root, I remember when she was on like the Choose Five podcast, um, it's just hearing her story, hearing her overcome the adversity of, of losing a child, hearing her overcome some of the adversity of some of the shame that she got because she didn't have the fancy car and she walked to work or maybe she brought her own lunch to work and all of that. Like those stories are helpful to me because I can then start to relate to those people. And so that's what we want to do. We want to help, uh, help share people's stories that may, may not catch, you know, be caught on other people's podcasts and, and all of that. And I think through the, the hearing of those stories, you start to, you start to be able to kind of open your mind to the fact like, Oh, well, they overcame this, this really hard thing, or that, that sounded really tricky, but they, they did it. You know, they, they reached for this dream and, um, maybe it didn't go exactly how they wanted, but they were able to problem solve their way out or, or, you know, they, they, the friend showed up just when they needed them to, to help them through that. So I think there's a lot of power in, in hearing those, those stories. And so that's why I'm, that's what I try to do. And, you know, sometimes if it's more like of a practical in this moment, like, well, I can't leave my job because of this. And then I do try to, you know, encourage people like dream up the worst case scenario, then start working yourself back from there. And sometimes just like putting it in that context Let's let's people, I think, open their mind to the fact that, okay, this is a possibility, but just like the market's probably not going to go to zero and the food supply is probably not going to drop all the way out. Like even those are, those are possibilities. <laughs> if you backtrack that a little bit, you can see that there's, there's a, a few ways to avoid that eventual inevitability or even build a little extra protection or extra cushion if you're afraid to do this thing because you feel like you don't have a, a big enough safety net. Yeah. But like from a coaching perspective, there's definitely something to be said for some people just aren't ready or maybe they don't really, you know, like I, neither of us are trying to push anything on someone that isn't ready or doesn't really want it. Right. And so if the conversation keeps getting shut down, that's fine too. But it's like, there's a lot to be said for focusing on what you do want rather than what you don't want and seeing where focusing on what you do want leads you versus focusing on what you don't want. Very cool. So uh, I, we might have talked about this a little bit, but how did you discover fire? Was that through Deb? Was that through your health issue or? Yeah. So I left my job and I think Chris started to see the little bits of freedom I had and just maybe wanted a backup plan B as well. And so we started looking at how our money could earn us money rather than just like stockpiling it away. And we went down that rabbit trail for a while. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So I, I never knew about the the RE part until we were probably halfway through the financial independence piece. Um, I think I took a lot of big aha moments from the fact that Debbie had left her job, her health was improving. So then it stopped to being this place of scarcity of like, oh, I've got to spend the next three life, years of our life intently with Deb because her she's not going to live that long to all of a sudden being like, oh, there is some in abundance here. And, and I want to explore, are there other ways that we could live where we had more of our time back? And so I think I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki, like back to back. And for whatever reason, that that was that first piece that allowed me to think of, well, I can go, you know, like I can walk to work every day and I can check in, punch in and then punch out and come home with money. Or I kind of like I, I pictured a little dollar going to work. For, you know, I was like, okay, I'm going to see my little dollars go off to work. They're going to bring home some money and then they'll come back. I'll stay home the whole day. Um, and so... So somehow that that became like I, I was like, oh, I'm fascinated with this. It, it allowed my mindset to open up a little bit more to the fact that I could s keep all this money in a in a quote unquote high yield savings account, making me one percent, which is safe. Or I could give those dollars a job and send them out into the investing world. And so then I started looking at self storage because I didn't want tenants, I didn't want toilets, I didn't want any of that kind of crap. Looked at self storage. And 
didn't go down that that rabbit hole too too long because I didn't have a I didn't have much of a network and I didn't have an, a big enough mindset of like oh well if I need six million dollars the only way at that time I knew is like Chris has to have six million dollars I didn't have six million dollars to buy this deal so I was like well I could buy this sixty thousand dollar house like <laughs> that's more affordable it comes with tenants and toilets and all those things that I thought were going to be horrible but um. Yeah. And at that time, we were vaguely familiar with the 4% rule, but we really started out with like $60,000. So we kept enough aside so that we could, we felt like live for a year uh, if we needed to, if everything went wrong with our plan somehow, you know. And and so we started out with a chunk of $60,000 and turned that into enough income for us to live off of. And so the 4% rule really didn't get us there very quickly. And we were looking to expedite it a little bit quicker than that. And so that's how we chose real estate versus like, you know, BTSAX or something like that. Right. And you mentioned that you discovered the RE part after you're like halfway there, like how long did it take you to stop working from when you first realized maybe you want to stop working. I know, Deb, you, you stopped working a couple of years before that, but yeah, how about for you, Chris? Yeah, so the, the sexy headline version could be, <laughs> we bought our first house in 2015 and I retired in 2019. There's, there's a lot of nuance you don't get with that story. We had already eliminated almost all of our debt. Like our mortgage was almost already paid off at that point. We had zero credit card, student loan, auto loan, any of those kinds of other debts to go along with that. So our, our life, our foundation was already pretty damn strong at that point. We just didn't have our money doing much work for us outside of like me investing in my 401k through work just up to the match and, and all of that. So then once, once, I dis, or once we, we bought a, a couple of rental properties, I was mainly just listening to bigger pockets at that point, but enough RE people kept showing up on bigger pockets and then they eventually spun off bigger pockets money. I don't know. Have you guys heard of that podcast? <laughs> podcast? <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So then, then I started to hear about all these other people, you know, like Mr. Carl Jensen and Mr. Money Mustache and all these other folks. And then, so then that kind of helped to even expedite some of those things even more where I was like, Ooh, I could crank up that dial on. Let me see, you know, how we can, how, how we can grow that gap between our income and expenses and, what is life going to look like? And so I just really started playing with that dial to try and even save more out of my paycheck uh, while we're also saving every dollar from our cash flowing properties to buy the next one, to buy the next one. And we got that snowball moving pretty good. So uh, that's And a- you had a new CEO come in. So yeah. you, up to that point, he really liked his job. He was like, I don't see a reason for leaving my job. And then he had a new CEO come in and there was some conflict and he could see a reason to step away from his job. And I think that was the impetus to really discovering the RE part of the equation. Yeah, good point. (laughs) Chris, we've talked a little bit before about your remote real estate investing. You work with a turnkey company out of state. How, How has that worked out? Yeah, so pretty well for the most part. Like it, it is cash flowed for us. Those properties have cash flowed for us, you know, all four or five years uh, that we've invested some months, it's uh, exactly, you know, uh, what we had expected to be. And then, you know, you have your maintenance expenses happen. Sometimes you have an eviction here or there, but I'm really happy with our, our property management company. I thought during the pandemic, they handled things really well. Like there was a part of me where I was like, Oh, here's where I get kicked in the, um, because <laughs> they're, they're starting to pass all these laws where it's like, you rich landlords don't need rent. Do you uh, go ahead and just, allow people to live in all your houses and you'll be fine. And I was like, Oh crap. (laughs) If that happens, I'm screwed. But, um, our, our, our property manager out in Memphis, they did a great job of, of threading that needle of taking care of the tenant and making sure they're, they're able to get through this stuff. They made them aware of these various programs, worked up payment plans and all that, as well as understood that, Hey, some of us investors on the backside aren't like, Black Rock hedge fund, you know, this isn't something we can weather for years. We do need, you know, some rent or we need some help. So it's been very beneficial. It's very because we also manage properties um, ourselves around us. And, you know, those are definitely more hands on. We do get a better return on those because we're not paying a property manager, but we have to do a little bit more work with those. 
So there's definitely pros and cons of, of both sides, but I, I highly recommend like almost always, you know, when my friends, you know, maybe uh, that have more money than time come to me, I, I would say, I don't know. I haven't been, I haven't bought a turnkey property in three years. So I don't know what the, what, what it looks like today versus when we were buying them, but I would highly encourage that, uh, to where you're, you know, it's more VTSA ish than owning properties myself where I have the tenants and everything. Cause basically every, every month I take the, the sheet they give me, I plug it into my bookkeeping software. And that 30 minutes was basically the, all the work I did for that month for those Memphis properties. That's awesome. So all your living expenses come from your rentals and are you saving money on top of that as well? We are. So Deb does have the retirement police. I don't think would ding us too hard, but she works about three weeks a year and uh, brings in uh, a healthy chunk of change for those three weeks. So that's our like extra gravy, but even just living off the rentals, we have enough to pay our pay our daily non-discretionary expenses, pay for a healthy travel budget and discretionary expenses. And we're still sticking money in uh, into the market and, and all of that. So yeah, we're actually uh, still investing today. Just more, more of the easy passive stuff. We haven't bought a rental um, in a while. And are you looking to get more rentals or you're at a good spot and you could sort of coast with that and there's no need to add more doors to the situation? Yeah, that's a funny question when you've been like looking at buying deals and how much can you make off the deals and there's a little itch that keeps like nagging at the back so like I mentioned earlier I flew to Costa Rica to check out some rentals there um and that was maybe like a little distraction we didn't end up getting those we feel really comfortable where we're at now we're honestly trying to create different type of work for us than creating more rental work, but there is that little itch back there still. Try something different. Try something new. If a great deal came across, we probably wouldn't turn it down, but that's not where our focus is necessarily. And the rentals we have now are enough to sustain us and provide extra. So, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, I was telling some friends recently is I we have a decent chunk of money, again, that we're we're looking to do something with buying more rentals kind of raises the needle a little bit, but like I want to go out and learn something new. So when we, when we first started buying real estate, I had to listen, I had to listen to a lot of podcasts. I had to read a lot of books. I had to meet a lot of new people. So the next thing that we invest in, I think that sounds fun is, is to do something where we either have to meet people that we want to meet in order to, to, to access those kinds of investments or learn, learn new things. So I'm, I'm kind of playing around with maybe a franchise is in our future or maybe self storage is in our future or maybe some of these other types of investments uh, might be in our future and we don't need them but it would it be a seems like a good good thing to do. And that feels like the big question in our lives right now. Like I don't know how you guys decide that also cuz you probably are in the same place but it's like when is enough enough and how do you know it's enough and yeah, there's this human quality of just like, I need more, I need more, I need more. But it's like, oh, this is enough. Like, can we just live in this moment of enough and enjoy that? So there's a balance there. It's like always a question. I don't know if you guys have an answer to that. Yeah, what's your guys' answer? (laughs) Yeah, well, that's a constant struggle. But I mean, you, you already have a podcast, so I can't tell you to start one. But Carl and I, did this and it's been, you know, it's been work. It's been a lot of fun. We've met people. I've met a lot of new people, but just one of those things where I guess I wanted to start something new and it's often more fun to work with someone, even Carl. No, it's it's often more fun to work with someone, especially, you know, someone I didn't know that well, and it's been awesome so far, but it is tough. And I have to, I, I spent time, saying yes to so many opportunities, like, like y'all buying more rental properties. And then at some point you took a beat, it's been a little while you let the smoke clear a little bit and you can sort of reassess like, well, I don't need to do the same thing and keep pushing harder and harder. You can look at your new perspective, I guess, and and figure that out. Carl, what do you think? Yeah. I'll back up a second time. I really liked your quote, a second ago, can we just live in the moment of enough? That's really good. 
But I think my answer to that is kind of along the same lines of what Chris said a moment ago. I'm thinking about doing some other projects, but the primary motivation for it isn't money. Well, I expect them to make money is to collaborate and build something fun with friends. So kind of back to the obstacles the way it'll be a challenge. We'll be getting out of our comfort zone, but this challenge will make us happy and it probably will make money, but that's not the primary driver of it. Yeah. You know, very good. So Chris, when, when did you stop working again? Uh, so right before Thanksgiving of 2019. Okay. It, certainly interesting time to stop working. So yeah, I'm curious about the transition and if it's been different than what you expected. And Debbie, feel free to answer as well, but I know you stopped working a little while ago. So I'm, I'm interested in Chris's fresh perspective. Yeah, both. There, there are definitely the, the things that I dreamed of, like the big adventures uh, hitting items on the bucket list, uh, more time with family. Those things were very much like I expected. I thought I'd done enough research by talking to enough people and listening to enough podcasts that I, I was like, no, oh, I, I won't have the lows because I've heard of some of these people that like they they fire and then like six months later, they're like, this is the most depressed I've ever been. I'm like, well, I'll, I'll avoid that fate because I'm smarter than them or something like that. I did find just the lack of identity or the how much identity I had wrapped up in my job. And I felt like I was unpacking that that last year or two that I was doing, uh, that I was still working. I thought I was like letting go of that identity as I'm starting to transition, hand the baton of leading my team over to another person as I'm starting to not show up as much as I'm starting to do different roles as I'm starting to not be included on certain meetings. I was like, okay, this is just part of me letting go of that identity of Chris, the the team lead for these network engineers and starting to embrace this this new new life. But until I got that full freedom of not having that job and not being able to say like, oh, I'm a I'm a team lead of network engineers, I did not realize how much of my identity was still wrapped up in that. And the other piece that has caused me turmoil is or I, as I've started to kind of excavate some of these inner problems that I didn't even know existed was just how much I had written a story or allowed my story to be written that people that are productive are good. People that are not productive are not good. And so when I had a, a just a chill day at the house where it's like, oh, I had lunch with my daughter. We walked to the park or went took the dog for a two-hour run and all that kind of stuff. Amazing days. And then I would feel like shit at the end of the day. Um, and it took me weeks and months to figure out that, you know, my family, hardworking people just really value hard work and laziness and uncleanliness and like untidiness <laughs> are all things that um, are beneath us. And, and so it was, yeah, it was very eye opening and maybe helped me avoid a midlife crisis that <laughs> would have came later on or whatnot. So I'll, I'll pause there because sometimes yeah. when I go too long, I, I get <laughs> sidetracked. So. Well, that was great. I'm glad you mentioned the productivity piece. And I think I saw Carl raise an eyebrow as well over there. But I, I probably have 20 productivity books back there. And I've been trying really hard just to chill the fuck out a little bit, you know? Yes. So have you been able to do that, Chris? Are you, I mean, I guess you spent 53 days on on the trail a little while back. So you have to you have to relax and just deal with whatever nature throws your way. But yeah, how are you dealing with the more chill post-retirement area? Much better. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, who knows, five years from now, it'll be a different, maybe probably a different story, but I feel like I'm, I'm almost there, but I still run into those problems. But now I have a few more tricks that I, that I use as far as like even either giving myself space or doing a little more meditation or just opening up with Deb and, and helping her, letting, letting her help me through some of those, those pieces. Yeah, much, much better. And the more I talk about this, like when I have these kinds of conversations about like, here's what I, apparently I was addicted to, or I just had created this mindset that it's, you know, this is what good people do, A, B, C, D, and E. The more I, I see some, some shiny eyes uh, listening to me and, and start to reflect their story of like, oh my God, you know, that's me too. And I was like, yeah, I think it's... <laughs> I think it's it's out there for probably a lot of us, you know, that uh, that are probably listening to this podcast. You know, if you're this motivated to to learn about these these concepts and to buy some freedom, freedom 
freedom comes. But uh, I, I tell this often. I was like, if you want easy, this may sound counterintuitive, go to a W-2 job where there's already a culture and expectations. And this is what you're going to do at 7 a.m. This is what you're going to do at 9, PM, 9 a.m. And this is what you're going to do at 2 p.m. If you want hard, have a blank effing canvas of a day. And you know, it's like, am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? Am I going to do this? And then you know, gr- grapple with some of those, uh, those underlying issues that I didn't even know existed. So Chris, I have a follow-up question for you because I can uh, relate to this conversation very much. I guess I never had the thought that good people are productive. But with me, I don't feel good if I haven't had a productive day. So I feel like if I'm sitting around not doing work that I kind of go into a little state of depression and I don't feel good about myself at the end of the day. And maybe I've gotten over it a little bit, but I still struggle with that. Have you struggled with that? And how do you overcome something like that? And by the way, this you mentioned the books, Doug. I think you two should collaborate on a book called Anti-Productivity. Why, why it's okay <laughs> yeah. to sit on your ass all day. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely still struggle. And especially this time of year, like Deb and I have, I don't know, maybe this is a little too personal, but we've, we've kind of been going through a little bit of a funk around here um, with a little overall malaise of like, it's, it's colder, less sun. Most of the things I love doing involve being outdoors, gardening, uh, running, and all of that. So even though sometimes gardening and running, I don't quite tick the box of productivity, they at least allow me to feel like I did something that was in alignment with my values. And so if I'm doing something that's in alignment with my values, which my three values are connection, growth, and adventure, if I'm doing something that is in line with those values, I feel much better that day. Or when I'm assessing my day at the end of the day, I can say like, Hey, I talked to Doug. I talked to Carl. That was connection. Connection is important to me. I grew because I had this difficult conversation with my daughter. So when I can do that, it sometimes replaces those, oh, well, I, I came in under budget on this project or mm-hmm. I, I put in you know, six hours of... Flo- I did flooring for six hours today or I, I built this thing. So sometimes I, I, like to, I have to have a box to tick off of a to-do list, but I'm, I'm trying to do less of that because sometimes I just start saying yes to a bunch of busy shit that's more of a distraction from the thing I really want to do, but I'm a little scared to do. So it's like, oh, well, I'll go sweep the garage for six hours. <laughs> you know. And if I, if you don't mind, if I jump in, I what I learned about myself is that my ego wanted to feel worthy in some way. So productivity, accomplishment equals worthiness, right? We leave our job. We we don't have that reminder to sort of prop our ego up, even if we don't like realize we identify with it. Like I, back when I worked, I would have said like, Oh no, my, I don't really have an ego. It's small. But when I left my job, it was like, who am I now? What am I now without this job? So I found all these things to make, to keep me busy, make me feel like I was worthy. I, you know, I was a good person and slowly over time, what's helped me is to think instead of goals like and accomplishments in a productivity place, I think of how I want to feel uh, coming into this year. What are the feelings I want to have daily? And then I plan my day according to how I want to feel. So do I really want to feel accomplished or do I really want to feel productive? Or is there actually something deeper I'm searching for when I'm constantly going to like, what am I going to accomplish? How was I productive today? Is there really something I'm looking for deeply within that I just keep going back to those places for and not finding them? Yeah. When I ask myself those questions, rarely do I feel like, oh, this year I'd really like to feel productive. It's, it's usually something different. And so then I can design my day around. So I might still be really productive laying some LVP in my dining room, right? But I'm coming at it from a different place and maybe hopefully a more conscious, aware place of why I'm doing that work versus like, I'm going to be really good at like getting a lot of stuff done today. Yeah, I like that answer. You mentioned ego, and I think that's another Ryan Holiday book, right? Ego is the enemy. Yes. So I thought book for me. <laughs> yeah, that's a great book. I think um, letting go of your ego is probably one of the most important things you can do for I don't know what the self actualization or self development. So. Yep, totally agree. So 
Debbie, how long ago did you stop working? I think my last year of teaching was 2015. I think 2014, 2015, somewhere in there. Okay. And what do you miss about it? I know a lot of times we're like, oh, we just want to retire and get away from the politics or whatever, but I assume you enjoyed it for some reasons. So yeah, what do you miss? Yeah, when I left my job, it was I was really like at my peak with my with my career. So I was like working into some leadership, doing some instructional coaching with some other teachers. And I was working with kids in small groups that needed some intervention, some extra help or were advanced and needed some things at their level. And so it felt, I was also at the lowest point with my health, right? So it was like this, just this really weird place to leave my job. And so I read that you gave us a little bit of prep beforehand. And I read that question and I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to say? But I do miss that like leadership piece of it. I like looked at data a lot to like figure out exactly what kids needed and, and give them those or, or write those interventions for them. So there, there was some mind stuff there doing some work and then some leadership things, some coaching that I, I do miss occasionally, but to be honest, I, I don't really at this point want to go back to that cage. There was a while there where I was like, I'm going to go back to teaching next year. Or, you know, like I'm, I'm jumping back in and I don't have that itch anymore. And I've found other ways to like fulfill those leadership roles in my life. But yeah, I do. I'd miss that a little bit. Yeah. Well, and, and perfect. I was going to say, how have you figured out how to replace those without going back to the job to, you know, feel, feel fulfilled? That's a tough sentence in that area. Right. So writing the book was definitely a big chunk of work for a long time. Uh, and now working on Go Bucket Yourself and the places I can use my strengths to step in are are still in line with those areas, I think. And so those definitely help to have a purpose outside of you know, being a mom and a wife is, is great. It's that I want to be the best mom and wife I can, but it, it doesn't fulfill all of this purpose that I, I want in life that I seek. So yeah, those things definitely help. And for both of us, it's just been a lot of trial and error. So like right after Debbie left, she signed up for, to volunteer on the library board. And so you might think, oh, that might scratch some of that leadership itch or that collaboration itch. But she realized quickly that that just wasn't her jam. It was just trading one <laughs> too much politics about some crap for another one. Um, but now, like she in 2020, I think created her own like peer mastermind where she gets a group of ladies together uh, every other week, and they, they you know they they support each other, they acknowledge each other, they they hold each other accountable, and they test each other and and connect and everything. And so, so it wasn't the library board that brought that that leadership and connection, but she found it in that peer mastermind. And so it's just a lot of trial and error. And, and that's what we're trying to do is just hold, get curious about things and hold them a little loose. And then the path starts to reveal itself a little bit more of like what the next, like, no, no, yes, you know, mm -hmm. and just keep trialing it. Yeah. And did you guys run into any issues on the path to FI, any bad investments or hiccups along the way? And it's okay if you don't, if you didn't run into any problems at all, that, that's amazing. But yeah, just curious. So this is, I guess, a lot of that mindset shift that when we went back to the core values of Go Bucket Yourself, this is a big piece of it because I want to just say like, no, we haven't had any big issues. That's really not true. It's just like our mindset around what is a big issue, I think, has shifted. I don't think we've actually, even including Memphis, had to go through a full legal eviction with any of our tenants. But we've had issues that if we would have had those with our first rental when we just got started, we probably would have lost our mind, right? But we, we've been able to work on our mindset a little as we go. So I think with our very first tenants, we had some problems with their hot water heater and we were just so stressed, like beside ourselves. Like, I mean, looking back, even if we just bought a whole new hot water heater, which is what I think we did and had it installed, it's like, pfft, 
No, that's not a big deal. If you asked me, did I have a major problem? Now I'd say no. But if you would have asked me then, I would have said, yes, I, our tenants, they keep getting cold water and we're trying to fit, you know, like it was this big deal. And so along the way, I mean, we had a tenant that had a pig in the house that we didn't know about. Like that turned out to be a small problem. Uh, but at the time it felt very big. We had a tenant that relapsed into very severe addiction during the pandemic and that all worked out. And so I think it is a, it's definitely a mindset shift where you're able to see problems from a different perspective. Uh, we've never had like lost a house or lost a huge chunk of money. We've had months where the cash flow was a lot less than we expected for sure. And we've learned to see that that cash flow goes up and down and it evens out over time to be more than we even, you know, projected that it would be. But sometimes if you look at it month to month, you're going to feel like, oh, is this the end? Are we, you know, did we, did we make these terrible decisions? So I don't know how you would answer that. Yeah. Th those were really the, the only major obstacles that were just us running into these new issues as landlords for the first time that we'd never experienced before. Um, and so once, and with each one of those, like Debbie pointed out, well, we just got a little bit stronger and a little bit better. And then on the other side, like we still do have a significant chunk of money, you know, in the market doing its jam. And so the mindset there has been very easy now, I guess at, the, at this point in my life to where it's like, when this may sound cruel to, to say, but like when the market takes a big shit, I'm, I'm like smiling, like, I'm like, come on, especially when I know it's like, oh, this is an emotional sell. Everybody's selling their shit, you know, and everything. And so, so I'm, I don't encourage timing the market. I don't believe you should time the market. You should just, you know, dollar cost average over the long run. But now I have a little bit more money that I can play and time the markets. And, and so that is just like, just huge growth that like 10 years ago, like, even though I, I didn't think I needed to touch the money for 50 years or 40 years, uh, I would still like, have this big like unease, you know, when I would see the markets go down, you know, 5% or 10%. So just, yeah, perspective and growth over the time. How did you find out that someone had a pet pig? Oh, this is, Oy. so it can be a funny story. I can play the funny end or it can go, be Go the funny, funny route. Don't go the, the yeah. yeah. So short, to make that short, she was late on rent. I went over to collect the rent in person or post a notice to quit on her door and found like a window open and went and looked in the window. And I freaked out because I did not know what was staring back at me. So I came home and got Chris and the pig had been there for some time and it had eaten the couch. And so it was, there and the was drywall and the trim. Yeah. Like it was, I mean, the pig was in bad, bad shape. Yeah. So it, it was emaciated and, and not well. Um, you, I thought you said play the funny. Right? Oh, I mean, yeah. And then, so yeah, it was sad in the end, uh, both for the tenant and for her pet, but we have a great tenant that lives there now knew exactly what happened, went over to look at it with me when I was still in the middle of rehabbing that. And he was like, yes, this is the place I want. And he's been there for what, three years? Is yeah, he three on his third years. lease? Yep. So it all worked out fine for us. So yeah. Okay. So I have one more follow-up. I liked what you said, Deb, a moment ago about mind mindset shift, but I think there's something else to it. What I've noticed since I left my job is I have more Willpower. And I think it's because you can only deal with so much shit that's thrown at you in the day. So if you've got a job, and especially if it's a bad day, the last thing you feel like doing is working out or having a difficult conversation with your kids or spouse. But you take that away, and then all, all of a sudden, you've got a lot more willpower to deal with other crap. And maybe the problems that would have happened don't seem that bad because you've got the mental bandwidth and actually the physical, the time bandwidth to deal with these things. Have you noticed that as well? Yeah, do you have a comment on that? I think so. Like, and I, we just had Maggie with Friends on Fire on our podcast, and that's what she was saying. Like, you know, back when, or what she still is working um, with aspirations to to Ari, but she's like, now I notice she notices a lot of time that she was giving her best, you know, to these other people. So yeah, you're just depleting your your willpower tank. So when I would come home from work, like I would just be. I'd be tapped out. Like we, we worked 10 hour days and especially this time of year where it's like I go to work 
like I'd get up early and exercise. So I'd get up at 4 a.m. and get home at like 6 p.m. And I was just wiped. Like there was zero energy to be dad or husband, like barely present, let alone actually give my best and everything. And so now, yeah, I, I can... I, I can still do that. I can still screw up and and burn my my willpower out on other things that aren't important to me. But I'm more mindful of that, and I try to curate my time around those things that are important and valuable to me, and give them my best, and then uh, let the other stuff get kind of like the lackluster uh, version of Chris. Yeah, thank you. I needed a minute to think about that, but yeah, what I found is creative energy and physical energy are finite, right? They're not infinite. So when you're able to leave your nine to five behind, then you do have, I certainly had more creative energy and more physical energy for what I truly valued. The trick was getting really clear about what my priorities were and what I really valued. So I wasn't misplacing that creative energy and that because like Chris said, I, I would go to work and spend so much time and energy and patience on other people's children or other adults that required a lot of time and energy and patience. And I came home to my own children with very little of that left. And so, yeah, before I realized consciously what I truly valued and where I wanted to put my time and energy, I again, sort of threw it away. Like, not that this was bad work. It just wasn't my work. The library board or I don't know, essential oils for a while was like a big thing, you know, so just random little like swim officiating. And, and so I had to realize like, that is finite. What do I really value? Where do I really want to put that time and energy? But yes, if I had a pig in a house and I was working nine to five, that would have been much harder to deal with and find the solution to than it was for me at the point that that happened in our life. Have you ever considered a pet pig, Doug? I don't think Georgie the dog would appreciate a, a, a pet pig. No, she's more of a one pet kind of family, but yeah, I'm a dog guy. So I probably wouldn't go the pig route. How about, how about you? I don't know. I, I hear they're super smart and you could probably potty train them, although you might be able to speak to that, Dev and Chris. I'm not so much of a pet person. They're too much of an infringement on my life. So. My guy needs a, a pig mascot, I believe. You so, should yeah. have a pig mascot. <laughs> they are adorable. I personally love pigs, but I do not want one as a pet in my nope. house. So. Okay. Yeah. T-shirt idea for FinCon 2022. Yeah, yeah. Incorporate a pig. Oh, so, we'll be pig first. riding a T-Rex. Yeah, we want one too. Make one for us. All right. We can work that out. Well, <laughs> the question here is what can the listeners take away and use on their journey to five? I think you've given us so many embedded in many of the answers so far, but do you have any others that maybe you want to throw in that we didn't get to along the way? I think, I mean, the main message of our lives is I believe that you have a lot more power and control over your life than you may think you do at this moment, right? So each thing we did getting from point A to point B, it wasn't all done at one time. It was just little steps in taking back that personal power and changing what we needed to in ourselves and our lives so that we could do that in our life. And so I hope that's the message that like, whatever it is you're seeking or you hunger for, it's available to you. Maybe not all at once, but little steps at a time, um, you can get there. Yeah. I think that's, that's such a big one to me. I think that was very instrumental for us is just being able to break the, the big concept of someday we may not have to work for a job down into those tiny steps of I've got to put in five offers this week. And that's a lot more feasible. Like that's five phone calls I have to make or five emails I have to write. That that I can wrap my head around a lot more than I can, you know, like how do you how do you have 19 rental properties and everything? And so I'm always trying to encourage or pick that those pieces out of our stories that were just tiny little steps um, each and every day. Or you know, maybe not every day, but those tiny little steps and uh and that just leads to to some some big things. It probably sounds cliche, and we're not the first ones to ever uh, say that, but uh, uh, we we can definitely say it is relevant to our story. 
And because not to like keep going, but because you said have to, or anytime we hear ourselves saying I have to, or I should at this point in our life, there's always a follow-up question, which is, is it true? So if you hear yourself saying like, oh, I have to go to this job, or I have to do this thing, or I should do this thing. Is it true? Is it really true? That's a very empowering place to approach your life from. Just question those narratives you have in your mind. Is it true? Yeah. A lot of times we we pick up someone else's narrative and just run with it. Like the to be a good mom, I have to have my kids in 55 different events. And you know, maybe your your candle isn't get, getting burnt out from a job. It's just feeling like you've got to be the best mom and the best mom you know, has a kid that plays violin, speaks Mandarin and, you know, is state champion swimmer and is a gymnast, you know, and it's like, okay, is that true? Is that true? <laughs> Do you know any moms that are, are you feel are, are pretty good moms and they don't have all those things in their kids? So what does the perfect day or week look like for you both? You go. Oh, uh, what? You always yeah. make me go first. Uh, Sorry. No, I, this is a great question. I I love doing this exercise yearly with Deb. So like we'll do a little marriage retreat where the purpose is basically to ask each other these kinds of questions to get to know ourselves better and each other better. My perfect, I guess, quote unquote, normal day where I'm at home is I get up early, I exercise, I read and have a, have a cup of coffee with, with Deb in the sunroom while we, we chat and then maybe take the girls out for, for lunch or do something fun with them, like a fun daddy daughter date and, and all of that. And then the afternoon, maybe we're playing a, a board game around the table after a good dinner that I made. So that's kind of like my perfect, you know, not wild day. Like, uh, you know, I'm off on some, in some country climbing a mountain or, or something like that. So that's my, that's my pretty, pretty damn good day. Mm. Well, this is full disclosure. I'm still working on this. I would much rather focus on what Chris's perfect day is than mine. So I I like that. I made him answer that question first. Uh, What I do know is that for me, it does involve like movement with my body somehow. So some sort of exercise, definitely reading and journaling. Probably if we're talking about perfect year, perfect day, there's a beach involved at some point. And what Chris likes to mention is that Winston Churchill, was it Winston Churchill? Yeah. He took like two hour baths every day. And I think he read for two hours, right? Yeah. It was two hour baths, two hour reading, and then a two hour nap. I was like, yeah. oh, Winston, you got the trail. So <laughs> I'm thinking he and I are like, you know, like soul, like so our souls are connected somehow because I'm really enjoying like long Epsom salt baths also. So I could just follow the Winston Churchill method and be pretty spot on too. So I was waiting for Chris to include something about pooping in a hole. Kidding? So, yeah. Oh, uh, you sorry, I let you down, Carl. You could have brought it all the way back around full circle, Chris. I can't wait to see what your shirts look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Okay, uh, another sort of lifestyle question, uh, what activities make you lose track of time? And of course, both of you can answer. Mm. Okay, I'll go first. Fine, Chris, this time. Sometimes writing really makes me lose, lose track of time. Being on the beach, inside the, you know, in the ocean, on a surfboard, on the water, just a paddle board. Usually, yeah, that like involving the water, views or drinking tea. I think I could drink hot tea outside staring off into space all day long and not realize that's what I'd done. So. Yeah. Mine are are definitely, I, I, I'm, I'm working to be more creative. So I kind of get into a flow state where I lose track of time. Like if I'm uh, planning for this event that, that I want to do in 2022, like I can, I can do that. But the easiest way to do it is to basically this. Like if I go to a camp fi and maybe it's in the morning and there's just a four of us, few early birds awake and we're having our coffee out on there, like it could, you know, hours just go by in an instant where it's like, oh shit, we got to be to that. Uh, that speaker's getting ready to talk right now. And it just felt like we just started talking or our, our friends and I, we rented a house on a lake in North Carolina this year. Same deal. Like 
go out there on the deck and ha- start drinking coffee. And next thing I know, it's like, oh shit, we better feed our kids. It's noon, <laughs> you know? And so, so yeah, I, I just lose learning about other people's stories, hearing their stories, talking about the real shit. Those things are just like, uh, yeah, I, I tap into a whole nother universe uh, to when I go there. So what about pooping in a hole? Like you have to mention that again so that Carl can wrap <laughs> well, it up. For that. Okay. So I actually don't lose track. A lot of times when I'm on the trail, I'm thinking about like, oh my God, I'm, I've gone so many miles. Am I almost done? Am I almost done for today? Like uh, uh, that kind of thing. So I, I can, I can tap into that flow state while I'm out there too. Uh, it, it helps to have people around for me to like really lose it or not lose it in a bad way. But Hey, right. what about you guys? Can I ask you guys? Is that allowed? Just because sure. I'm Yeah, we love it. For me, I've been playing a lot more guitar lately. I've been taking lessons, doing finger style, and I can lose track of time. Like hours will go by and it's fantastic. You know, it's stress free. And then I'll look up and, you know, three hours went by, just like you're saying. Nice. Yeah, I like to write too. I can relate to what you said, Deb, about that. If I get into a good story, hours pass and uh, it's super awesome. But I love the ocean too. I'm going out to San Diego a week from tomorrow to see a a good old friend. But the first thing I'm going to do is not see him. I'm going to drive straight to the ocean and just sit there on the seawall and observe the waves for as long as I feel like it. And then I'll go see him. And then I'll I'll drag him back and we'll have discussions, but while watching the ocean. Mm, it's, it's, uh, ocean's kind of like a campfire you can just sit there and stare at it and sometimes it's better with a beer too yeah exactly yeah well not beer i don't drink beer but hot tea that would be good or i do like oh, a, a vodka, little vodka drink. a yeah. little vodka drink that'd be all right yeah. <laughs> so chris you alluded a couple times to the event that you're thinking about can you tell us a little about that i didn't let you know i was going to ask or if you could disclose it but <laughs> yeah, uh, super secret. Like my word for the year is, is momentum because I want to, uh, I want to keep momentum. So I want to keep talking about her. Like before we started becoming real estate investors, one book I read said, you just have to start telling people you're a real estate investor. And it's like, this feels like I'm a fraud because I don't own a property. I've never even put an offer in on a property, but that's what I'm telling people now is like, I'm putting on an event and I'm putting on an event. So there's A lot of people now that know that Chris is doing an event and that's going to hold my feet to the fire. So I don't have all the details planned out. I want to do it in the fall, probably in Colorado, probably around the idea of like authenticity, meaning, purpose, and not to be like extremely heavy where it's just like, we're just going to, I don't know. Anyways, so that that event is to be determined in many, many ways. But uh, my intention is to have a lot of those things even ironed out this week and next week and Keywords, adventure retreat where people can come together and work on really getting clear clear about what they value and begin making a plan for designing their life around it, right? So there will be adventure involved and some other sort of things that allow people to really tap into what they really want and plan for that in their future. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Cool. (laughs) And then... Deb, you mentioned the master, the peer mastermind. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I, I mean, most of the things I've ended up doing have been like, I didn't want to do them. They just kept nagging me and wouldn't, you know, stop nagging me. So I'm like, I guess I better do this. So the mastermind was that thing. I knew I was writing uh, this book and I knew I would have a lot of trouble putting it out in the world and making it public. And I felt like I could really use a group of women to just get together with on a regular basis. And most of those women didn't really live around me. And so I thought if I could like sit down every week or two and have a cup of tea with several women, who who would I meet at the coffee shop? And I asked them if they would be a part of this mastermind with me. And they magically agreed. And it's sort of morphed and and changed since then. You know, some people step out and new people step in. Um, But we get together every couple of weeks. It's a peer mastermind, this one that we're talking about now. So there's no money exchanged or anything like that involved. It's just women supporting each other and helping each other, you know, live the lives they want to live, accomplish the things they want to accomplish, being there to cheer each other on, hold each other to the fire, you know, question the narratives of each other. And we have accountability buddies within that. So, so we'll like 
chat with each other on the off weeks. And we're planning an event, hopefully, to get together sometime in person this year. So it's really become just a really wonderfully supportive group of friends that are very, as Diana Miriam from Economy says, she's like, it's the most type A way of friendship because everyone has busy <laughs> schedules. So we put it on the calendar when we're going to get together and then we make sure we do. So very cool. And just curious, Chris, did you ever get into a mastermind group or anything like that? No, um, <laughs> I, I did. I, I wanted to, but I actually, so I take that back. So I'm, I'm part of this community now called Front Row Dads. And it it serves that purpose um, where the concept is that we're 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 family win with businesses and and that and so that's been very helpful. I've made a lot of new connections. So it's like my two worlds now, besides my immediate family, are the financial independence world, you know, and my friends that I have in there, and then my front row dads community, where we're 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 guys that are trying to be better fathers and husbands and and. We also talk about the other stuff of life, investing, health, and and that kind of thing too. But it's always with the lens of, is this new thing going to take away from me being a better f- husband and father? And so that's a, that's a great community. I did not start it. John Broman started it. But it's it's been super helpful uh, over the last year and change. Cool. Carl, any more questions? I think that's it. I really enjoyed this. The three words, connection, growth, adventure. I don't have a tattoo, but if I did... I might get those three yeah. words tattooed on me somewhere. Uh, so good. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for being oh. on. And yeah, go ahead. Sorry, where, where should people find y'all? So go bucket Uh, if you wanted to buy my book, the other side of perfect or learn more about it, it's anywhere books are sold online, or you can go to go bucket forward slash books. The podcast is called Go Bucket Yourself, and it's anywhere you find your podcasts. I'm on Instagram under M, like I am perfect progress dot me. And I would love to connect with you personally, like DM me there, Chris, any yeah. your Instagram outside of uh, what she said with the website and our podcast. Uh, yeah, I'm on I'm on Instagram at bucket yourself. And yeah, I usually take people along on some of my adventures. I'm getting ready to go to the uh, Pacific Crest Trail for uh, a month or so here in in March and and everything. Yeah, so you will see pictures of me probably not shitting in the woods, but uh, I will take a picture of before and after of like, oh, this Ew. is uh, one maybe not of the hole, but like of me and how joyous I feel I now see. that after I shat in the woods. Okay. Well, f- full circle, but uh, we'll put links so everyone can get to that stuff uh, very easily. You don't have to write it down if you're driving or whatever. So. Thanks a lot. This has been amazing. And we'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast. And I'm Doug Cunnington, the Balder host. And Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five. And uh, actually, we don't give high fives in in person. So the virtual kind is pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using. And that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week.